again in the book of Mark, chapter 14. This speaks about the Last Supper. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, surely you don't mean me. It is one of the 12, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It will be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. When he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them, truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Thus says the Lord. Amen? I forgot to have y'all stand. I'm getting all this stuff together here. So we'll have the microphone ready and doing new things takes preparation, I'm finding out. <laughs> so praise God. In the American prison system, inmates who are ready to be executed get a last meal. Murderer Gary Gilmore ordered a hamburger, hard-boiled eggs, a baked potato, a few cups of coffee, and then he had some Jack Daniels whiskey smuggled into him. Domestic terrorist and mass murderer Timothy McVeigh ate two pints of mint chocolate chip ice cream. Robert Anthony Buell, another murderer, requested a single unpitted olive. Now, Texas ended the last meal policy in 2011 when Lawrence Brewer, yet another murderer, requested a huge dinner that consisted of a triple meat bacon cheeseburger, a meat lover's pizza, a big bowl of okra with ketchup, a pound of barbecue, a half loaf of bread, peanut butter fudge, a pint of ice cream, and two chicken fried steaks. Then he declined all of it, saying he wasn't hungry. That's why Texas, they're pretty smart. <laughs> Forget this business. Well, Jesus obviously didn't have the luxury of ordering a custom final meal before his death. But the last supper he ate was the most important meal ever eaten in the history of humanity. We'll look at how all this came about this morning. Now, before we took our break during the summer and studied the Psalms, we looked at the first 11 verses. But what happened in those previous verses sets the stage for what takes place now that we will be looking at. Here's a quick review. Mark 14, verses 1 and 2 says, Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. Now the Passover was a major festival in Jerusalem you're all familiar with. Every male adult within 15 miles had to attend, yet people came from all over the world. This festival commemorated the great deliverance of the Jewish people from their 400-year bondage of Egypt. Take a look at this. This is a more recent picture. For celebration. It's estimated that 
that upwards of 3 million people packed into the city at this time. And this was the time when the religious leaders whom Jesus offended over and over again with his teachings planned to arrest him and murder him. Now, they didn't want to murder him or arrest him during this time of celebration, but ultimately they ended up doing it anyway. In the next seven verses, there's a flashback, which is a foreshadowing of Jesus' death and burial. Verses 3 through 9. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. You know who was concerned about the money, right? It was Judas. And Judas got everyone all angry and upset, not realizing at all what she was truly doing. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. She loved Jesus so much that she was willing to take this very expensive perfume and anoint him a foreshadowing of the anointing he would get after he was dead. One man wrote on the cross, stripped of his clothing, Jesus would wear only the perfume that Mary had lavished upon his hair. It was that perfume which filled his nostrils and covered the stench of mockers rabbled around the cross. It's quite beautiful. After that beautiful scene, we flash forward to another ugly scene that started in the first two verses when the religious leaders plotted Jesus' death. Their plan now gets set into motion in verses 10 and 11. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Mary's beautiful gesture of sacrificial love went right over the head of Jesus. Oh, Judas. He didn't have eyes to see nor a heart that understood, did he? He had ulterior motives that concerned only himself. Can you imagine as, she, as Jesus is being anointed and he's sitting there watching this, he's first of all thinking, oh, what a waste of money because he himself used to help himself to the money bag. But not only that, he's thinking... How am I going to betray this man? What a hardened heart. What a hardened heart. We all know people like that, don't we? Now, cut to yet another scene. This morning's passage. Verse 12. On the first day of the festo festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Since Jesus knows that his death is coming soon, he makes preparations to have one final Passover meal with his disciples. But where, they ask? Verses 13 through 15. So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. Jesus is purposely vague. Why do you think he's vague about where this Passover is going to be held? Why do you think? Why did he just say it's 777 God Drive, right? Why do you think he's so vague? Think about it. Because if Judas found out, he'd be arrested during the Passover meal. The two disciples who have the location information are Peter and John, according to Luke. So we entrusted this information with his true two trusted disciples. Peter and John, James was, who knows what James was doing, but those were his three closest. They are trustworthy. 
There were no leakers in Jesus' administration after Judas was sent away. There were no more traitors listening in on phone calls from another room and no secret blogger taking notes and posting them on Twitter once Judas was out of the picture. But why a guy with a water jug? It's kind of specific. Look for the guy with the water jug. Wouldn't there be a lot of people lugging water in the middle of the day? No. Because domestic tasks in the first century were mostly done by women. So this man would stand out. Pretty clever, that Jesus, huh? The disciples are to mention the teacher to this man. Kind of a code name. This man apparently knew of Jesus, and he would then take them to a fully furnished upper room where they could enjoy the Passover together. Now, either this was prearranged by Jesus ahead of time, or it was done supernaturally. We don't know. Verse 16, the disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Has God ever told you to do something? And you're like, oh, I'm not, oh, no, I'm not, no. Oh, and you do it, and you go, huh, huh. God knew what he was talking about. Now, today, six years ago, I arrived in Texas. And I didn't know why I was sent to Texas except to plant a church. Didn't know what to do, didn't know how to do it, had no one with me except my family. But I did it anyway because I believe God told me to do it. And really, it didn't become clear what my purpose was here in Texas until I came to Community Church of the Hills. The original plan that I thought God had for me wasn't the plan God had for me. He, he reserves the right to change things, doesn't he? he? We see through that glass darkly. That's a reference to the type of mirror that people had in the first century, which wasn't a mirror at all. They'd look in a piece of burnished metal and they could only see a poor reflection of themselves. But now, as I see our church coming together this year, this year, frankly, it started with the marriage um, seminar you guys had, the marriage class. And then we had the baccalaureate service. And then we had a parade where everyone got together and built the float. And then we had another parade. And now we have this. It's all coming together according to God's plan. And I forgot, God reminded me that before we can be an outreach church, before the people are coming in from outside, we have to be built up on the inside. And guess what's happened this year, right? First year was a honeymoon for me. Everyone loved me. And then the next two years, not so much. <laughs> and then this year, thank God, it's all kind of leveled out. And all we need to do when God gives us those directions and we're not clear where to go, or he gives us very clear directions and we don't know why, all we're called to do is one thing. What is it? One word. Go, oh, go and obey. Go and obey, right? And we have a song. Who knows that song? Trust and obey. That's the bottom line. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. It was critical that Jesus had this meal. Because he would transform the 15-year-old, 1,500-year-old Passover into the Lord's Supper on this evening. This is why it was done covertly, so the betrayer Judas wouldn't get wind of it. Verses 17 through 19. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one, they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. Now Judas came to the Passover, but he only found out at the last minute before he could alert Jesus' enemies, thankfully. Now why were they reclining? See, we can read through these passages. If you go through your Bible, you're going to read it, but you don't really think a lot about that. But Jewish custom had people eating while resting on cushions with their heads toward the table and their feet pointing away. I kind of thought of Branson when he's eating, like watching TV with a pillow and a big bowl of popcorn, kind of like that, but not really like that, but kind of like I thought of you, but that's how it looked. Kind of comfortable. Maybe we ought to do our potluck this Thursday this way. Yeah, 
Just because Bill said no, that means yes to me. As beautiful as da Vinci's classic painting of the Last Supper is, it was completely and totally biblically incorrect. Big time, right? The first Passover in Egypt, by the way, was eaten in a hurry according to God's instructions in Exodus 12. It said this, this is how you're to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. But by the time Jesus got around to this, the Passover was a leisurely meal that lasted so long Jesus was able to wash the disciples' feet, eat the meal, initiate the Lord's Supper, and confront Judas. Not exactly eaten in a hurry, huh? You know how traditions change over time, right? Change over time. I'm reminded of the story that at the beginning of the service at this old church, that people would stand up, and they would face the left wall, and they would sing Amazing Grace. And they'd sing Amazing Grace. Every week like that, they'd stand up, face the left wall, and sing Amazing Grace. A newcomer came and was curious why they worshipped in that way. What was so special about that left wall? And one of the elders explained to him, well, years ago, we used to have the words of amazing grace painted on that wall, but now it's been painted over, but people still continued to face the left wall and sing it. So it's important to reevaluate traditions. They change over time, do they not? At some point during the meal, Jesus mentioned the betrayer, yet it's interesting, no one even suspected it was Judas. Why? He, was he that good? Was he that clever? I think he wasn't that good, but he was clever. But I think, like all of us, we're always so self-focused on what we're doing, we don't really pay attention to what others are doing, which is the whole point of our community getting together this year is now we're starting to care and get to know what's going on in each other's lives. And we pray and we minister and we reach out. That's the whole thing because naturally we don't care. Naturally we don't care. I mean, I put the Johnson City newspaper in the back and it tells you a little bit about what's going on. But how many of you really know what's going on in our city? Raise your hand. Joe. Actually, everyone tells Joe what's going on in the city. Okay, apart from Joe, most of us don't even know what's going on. And I'm starting to learn about some of the seedy underpinnings, the history of Johnson City. And I want to hope that we're going to be an antiseptic. Our church would bring about that revival. That's what I think it is. I just think the disciples weren't really paying attention to anybody but themselves. And by the way, they're in the presence of Jesus, so he's pretty fascinating, isn't he? So I don't mind if they're not paying attention to each other as long as they're paying attention to Jesus. What's so sad is that Judas was with Jesus this whole time, watching him perform incredible miracles, healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead, yet his heart remains hard. Nothing affected him. We all know people like that, don't we? You've taken a friend to church or a neighbor or a relative. They come, they hear the word of God clearly taught. They may even go through communion. They've seen the change in your life. They hear the word of God somewhere, anywhere, radio or television. But if you're in their life, they know about Christ in some fashion, but they remain unchanged. I'm saddened that my dad, my dad, still isn't saved, and I've been a Christian for 30 years. And you know how it is when you're a brand new on fire Christian saved from a life of immorality, you're on fire, I was that way, still am, but really crazily on fire those first three years. I was telling everyone they're going to hell and they needed to Jesus, and I had to apologize to mom. And my dad, though, has still remained unrepentant. He came to church here, what, a month ago, right? It was a clear reading of scripture as we went through Psalm 23. No. One time he found some gospel tracts on the floor of my car. And he happened to, he goes, what are these? I go, oh, they're gospel tracts. What are those? He picks it up and he reads it. And he reads it and he goes, you tell people this? And I go, oh, yeah. He goes, they're going to kick your butt. Well, he didn't use the word butt. And then for emphasis, he said, they're going to kick your butt. <laughs> and well, they, they do on occasion, right? But I just kept living it out. When I became a new Christian, I apologized to him for, for 
you know, being a irresponsible son. But when his sister died, several years later, guess who he called to do her funeral? And we sang Amazing Grace together at the little funeral service. When his nephew died, guess who he called to give the service? But dang it, I don't want to just go to the service. I want him to be in service, in service to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Judas is this. He sees the miracles. He sees the changes, but his heart remains completely unchanged. And the disciples were so sensitive that they, they each thought that they might be the betrayer. Surely you don't mean me. Oh, have you ever done that? Your boss calls a meeting. Someone's been photocopying their rear end. Who is it? And all of you like, you know, you would never do anything like that, but you did do a few extra copies of something because you had a bill to pay or, and you start just feeling guilty. Well, that's how they all felt. They all think, surely not me. Verses 20 and 21, Branson, I know the only thing he's going to remember out of this sermon <laughs> Verses 20 to 21. It is one of the 12, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Judas was sharing the same bowl with Jesus where they dipped flat bread into a paste of fruit and nuts. Ooh, let's, who wants to bring that for the... Okay. It's not explained if Judas looked surprised or ashamed or guilty. But John gives a fuller account of what happened then. In John 13, Simon Peter motioned to this disciple, John, and said, ask him which one he means. Isn't that great? Surely, hey, gee, who is it? Leaning back against Jesus, John asks, Lord, who is it? Remember, John was the one Jesus loved, so he felt he had this special privilege. Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So now he gets a bit more specific. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, what happened? Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. And this is a clever, interesting foreshadowing the next three words. Say it. And it was night. That's a poetic device. It was night. What was going to happen was going to be very dark indeed. But now we understand how this came about. Of course, none of this took Jesus by surprise because God has strategically used Judas's betrayal to begin his own plan for saving lost sinners. This was God's will. Still, Judas was responsible for his actions, was he not? Though God works everything out for his own purposes, even overruling people's sinful choices for his glory, it does not take away the responsibility that Judas had. He made a sinful choice and God used it for his purposes. Just like we make sinful choices, but God works those choices out. God very rarely, if ever, gives us a index card telling you his will because if he did that wouldn't be by faith we pray we get notions we read the word and we act by faith and if we make a big stinking mess of it guess what all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes that is good news so that means you're free to act on God's will now I recognize if you get a notion, this is what the pastor and the elders are for. Come and ask. We'll look through scriptures. We'll talk about it. And then we'll say, well, you know, go for it. 
and then let's see what happens. We need to start living by faith and not by sight, right? We're Americans, so we want proof. Still, Judas was responsible for his action. God is completely sovereign, yet man is 100% responsible. Does that make any sense to you? No. 100% God, 100% man. Say that, please. 100% God, 100% man. God is the ultimate mathematician. He can make it work. All I know is this. I'm responsible. God is sovereign. Judas chose to betray Jesus and not believe in him, which condemned his soul to hell for eternity. Jesus said it would have been better that Judas had never been born because now he is suffering in a place of eternal torment where there will be no relief, none. Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the same is true for everyone today who would reject Jesus Christ is their savior. That's why there's an urgency to tell people of Jesus. I think we live with the profound absence of the knowledge of hell, so there's no urgency. We don't see that that neighbor down the street, that checker at Lowe's, the guy who you order your coffee from at Stripes doesn't know Jesus, and when he dies, which could be that very day, he will go to hell. I haven't spoken about this for a while, but I just, something's happened in the last several weeks where, golly, we need to do something. We need to say something. I included an article in your bulletin today with a picture from Union Theological Seminary where the seminarians are gathered around a plant confessing their sins. And that inspired me to write an article about how every single university in America was once, let me say 90% of the universities in America were Christian. 106 out of 108 universities first started in America were Christian. Not one of them, not one of them remains. Not one of them. My daughter goes to Baylor, as you know, and they had a pastor, in quotes, giving the invocation at the graduation where he essentially repented for being a white man. Okay, that's ridiculous. One of her college professors I've mentioned before said he would mark her down on the next paper if she didn't use gender-inclusive language for God. Okay, ba Baylor used to be a proud Baptist university, but no more. No more. When I was touring the colleges, Christian... Texas Christian University. Now you would think, that's a Christian university. Well, I looked at their vision statement, their mission, and it's essentially to promote equality and responsibility in the world. And I remember asking the professor, excuse me, what is that mission sta statement based on? And he couldn't answer. He couldn't answer. Duke University, their student government just made a decision that did not allow Young Life, the great ministry that we support financially and through our prayers here in Johnson City, Duke University, which used to be a Christian university, their student government did not allow Young Life to be a student group on campus because they adhere to Christian values when it comes to leadership. In other words, no, you, you can come, be a part of the ministry, be here, but you cannot be a leader if you're LGBTQ. You can't. Why? Because they have a basis, the Bible. So everyone who rejects Christ ends up in hell. And it's happening. We have great universities turning out hell-bound sinners. They get a doctorate in denial. They get a master's in denying the master. They get a bachelor's in bunkery and false teaching. That's why it's important that we understand there's a real hell and a real heaven, and if people reject Christ, they go to hell. Verses 22 to 25, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. 
This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, why would Jesus start a new memorial at Passover time? Because the Passover itself was a memorial to what God had done for the Jewish people when he delivered them out of 400 years of slavery in Egypt. You understand that? That was a memorial itself. The Passover meal celebrated the death angels passing over all the Jewish homes that had what? On the door sills. What? Yeah, what kind of blood? Lamb's blood. Smeared on the sides and tops of the door frames of their houses. The lamb they ate was without blemish and eaten along with bread without yeast and bitter herbs, symbolizing sin. This is quite beautiful if you think about this. That's why it's extensively in your notes to reflect on. Throughout the entire history of Israel, this meal was celebrated as a memorial to the Lord's great deliverance of the Jewish people from their enemies into the promised land. Reminding themselves they were slaves and God delivered them and brought them to the promised land. Jesus transformed this Passover meal into a celebration of a much more wonderful and greater deliverance he was about to bring, all of which the Passover foreshadowed for over a thousand years. What was that? When we eat the bread and drink the cup, we remember how God delivered us from our greatest enemy, sin, where we were slaves and didn't know it, right? How many of you were slaves to sin before you were Christian? Every hand. Put that hand up, young man. Turn around. Raise your hand. What are you raising your hand for? Yes, you're a slave of sin. Yes, good. All of us, right? We were all slaves. It's important that we remember that. It's important that we remember that. When we eat the bread and drink the cup, we remember how God delivered us from our greatest enemy, sin. We remember that he brings us into an eternal promised land by the sacrificial death of Jesus, the perfect lamb of God who offered his body and blood for us by dying on the cross. The Passover remembered a temporary deliverance brought about when God delivered the Israelites from Egypt. Temporary. The Lord's Supper is a memorial to the spiritual deliverance of the new covenant which lasts forever to all who have believed in Jesus as payment for their sin. Can you see how perfectly they balance each other out and how one replaces the other? The bread that represented the exodus of the Jewish people from Egypt now represents his body. When we eat the bread, we are reminded that Christ's body was given for us, that he gave it all. The cup that represented the lamb's blood smeared over the door frames of an Israelite's home now came to represent the blood of the lamb of God shed for the salvation of the world. We now eat the bread and drink the cup, not to remember what happened at the Red Sea and the exodus of the people from that land, but to remember the cross and the Savior. We remember because we are commanded by Jesus to do this in remembrance of me. Participating in the Lord's Supper is not an option for the believer. God commands us to remember and to remember often. Holly, will you go get Beverly, please? Now, to the Jewish way of thinking, remembering meant much more than just bringing something to mind. When we remember something, go, oh, yeah, I remember, yeah. To truly remember is to go back in one's mind and recapture as much of the reality and significance of an event or experience as one possibly could. We remember Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, his agony, his suffering, his death, his very life given so that we may have eternal life. So at this time, I would like us to take communion, to remember the Lord's Supper. It's also called the Lord's Table. It's also called the Eucharist. We do not believe, like the Catholics do, that Christ's body and blood actually trans or actually him we're actually eating him no that isn't it that he turned from one substance his flesh into this substance no we don't believe like the lutherans do the lutherans believe that christ isn't actually in the bread and the blood but he's in under and through it figure that one out we're not even believing like the reformed people do that when you take 
the communion elements, there's a special touch of heaven. But that's probably closer to what we believe. No, we believe it's a memorial meal. We believe, we believe and we remember what Jesus did. And so that's what we'll do now. Beverly get some. Beverly. Thank you, Lord. I want to read from the words of Paul. He kind of distilled it all together in this passage in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Say thank you Lord and take the bread and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Please take and drink. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. This is the gospel. When we take communion, it is the gospel. It's everything anyone needs to know and to understand how to have eternal life and to live for Jesus. Amen? Amen. The last verse of our passage says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We're going to sing the hymn, and you guys can go out to eat. Thankfully, we don't have to go to Gethsemane. Jesus did it for us. Let's stand and let's worship him one more time. <clears throat>
and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. 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 God Amen. bless you. Have a great week. I hope that you're inspired to live and love for Jesus. Tell someone about it.